Rogues Gallery Uncovered. Bad behaviour in period costume. A non-judgmental expose into the scandalous lives of history's greatest libertines, Lotharios and complete bastards. This podcast contains particularly adult themes and a suggestion of colourful language. Actually, it's more than just a suggestion. Some of it's pretty filthy. If this is likely to offend, well, I don't really know what to tell you. I suppose you could listen to it with the sound turned down. Spank you very much. There's no such thing as flogging a dead horse in Regency London's most notorious house of pain. With Teresa Berkeley. Before we crack on, a quick shout out to lovable rogue Sophie, who last week became the first customer of the official podcast merchandise store. She should, possibly even as we speak, be sashaying through the streets of Berlin resplendent in a bad girl good behaviour t-shirt, which is the title of a soon to be released episode. Thank you very much Sophie and I hope you enjoy the t-shirt. The store has loads of exclusive t-shirts and mugs to choose from with, hopefully, amusing rogues gallery uncovered related phrases emblazoned on them. I had a really good time coming up with them all and trying my hand at design. I reckon, like Sophie, that you'll find something in stock that'll tickle your fancy. But then I would say that, wouldn't I? Anyway, have a look, let me know what you think. There's a link to the store in the show notes or visit roguesgalleryuncovered.com. Now, fans of the following sound effect are in for a treat. This tale is all about 19th century BDSM and corporal punishment, so you're likely to hear variations of it quite a lot. I promise I'll try really hard not to lazily overuse it. But I can't make any guarantees. Ooh, the following tale is written in the present tense of the period in which it's set, and as such may contain attitudes and opinions of the protagonists in their times which would today be considered unacceptable. As I'm not a freshly flogged Regency submissive with a high pain threshold and an erection, those attitudes and opinions are obviously not mine. 28 Charlotte Street, London, 1836. By God, that hurts. My back's on fire. I'm bleeding. I can feel the blood running down my legs. I didn't say stop, woman. Harder. Lay it on. I've been a very, very, very bad boy. That's it. Again, you strumpet, again. There's nothing like a good flogging to get a fellow's prick standing to attention. And there's no more skilled a practitioner of the art of flagellation than the lady who is, as we speak, tearing my ass to ribbons with a needle-pointed strap. Miss Teresa Berkeley. I've been coming here to Charlotte Street since it opened in 28, but I've been an avid follower of Miss Berkeley for many years. She's been catering for those of us who like to feel the whip for decades, and for a long time ran a very popular establishment in Soho Square. I remember it was a veritable mansion and housed many different rooms within which men and women of quality were routinely thrashed with all manner of painful implements. Let me think. There were the gold, silver and bronze rooms. The painted chamber, for those who enjoyed being hurt in vibrantly coloured surroundings. And the grotto and the coal hole, for those who preferred to suffer in the dark. There was even the skeleton room, where images of grinning skulls and flensed bodies added a frisson of terror to the delicious paroxysm of one's pain. But it was at this address that Teresa Berkeley became London's most sought-after governess. For it was under this very roof that she installed an apparatus that has truly brought the English vice into the modern industrial age. I think it's as important a scientific invention as the steam engine. And if I could find a way to use one to travel between Stockton and Darlington, believe me I would. They call it the Berkeley Horse. Of course, Miss Berkeley, being a woman of refinement, refers to it simply as a chavalet. It's a masterpiece of ingenious design. 
No longer will we have to endure the predictable sensations of being bent over a glorified wooden pony in order to receive our strokes. Anyway, as you can see, the Berkeley horse is an adjustable wooden frame covered in padded leather, to which one is securely fastened, face down, by wrist and ankle. The height and angle of the frame can be altered to suit the subject's stature and comfort preferences. A strategically placed hole for the face allows him or her to breathe, while another for the genitals allows unrestricted access to those particular centres of pleasure. I have spent many a pleasant afternoon naked in its tight embrace, having my back and buttocks scourged by a governess on one side, while a pretty young strumpet on the other shows me her quim while tickling my balls. <laughs> if the pain of the scourging becomes too unbearable and I start to weep, a solicitous tart will often take it upon herself to greedily suck upon my cock to enhance the sensation. A delicious act that would have been completely impossible before this remarkable apparatus. It's not, though, the very first purpose-built flogging device. A very clever, yet dissipated chap named Chase Price, back in the last century, built a machine that could beat 40 people at the same time. I hear that it's still in use today probably in the Houses of Parliament. The horse, however, is simple to produce and can be installed in any suitably private space. The chap who designed it said that his invention would make Miss Berkeley's name live on long after her death. And I suspect that he's right. You really should give it a go. Do you know that in London alone there are over 20 well-appointed salons such as this that cater exclusively for those who like to be flogged. And since the retirement of the eminent Miss Mary Wilson, who presided over the Eleusinian Institution in St Pancras, it's to Miss Berkeley's house that the most discerning customers now retire. She really is a most remarkable woman. Handsome, there's no denying it, even though she's now well past the prime of life. She's well educated and of good character. A devout Christian, she converses with intelligence and charm, regardless of a person's position or social status, before, of course, savagely beating them into a rapture. The skills of a governess, you know, are so highly prized that many young women of the town willingly undertake a long apprenticeship under the tutelage of an experienced hand, in order to fully learn the subtle nuances of inflicting pleasurable discomfort. One governess even passed on her skills to her own niece. What makes Miss Berkeley so special, in my opinion, is that she listens to her customers' desires, taking the time to understand each individual whim and caprice, however unusual. Then, if the price is right, she will do her utmost to gratify them. She exhibits the most valuable trait in a courtesan, in that she is genuinely lewd. She loves what she does and is moved by the swish of the rod, just as much now as she did when she was a young lady. Miss Berkeley is also discretion personified, which, considering the public stature of many of her clients, is another much appreciated attribute. You may well remember the scandal surrounding General Sir Airy Coote, who, after a distinguished military career, was so overcome with his flagellatory desires that he crept into a prominent boys' school in 1815 and offered some of the most likely lads a fistful of money if they'd flog him, or indeed allow themselves to be beaten in turn. He was, of course, caught by the school nurse, and although a subsequent donation to the school spared him from prosecution, the damage done to his reputation when the scandal became public was irreparable. He was dismissed from the army, lost his seat in Parliament, and died in disgrace eight years later. To relax, you know, among luxurious surroundings, confident in the knowledge that one's proclivities will never be known by the public at large, enables one to truly relax and give full rein to whatever scenario best gets the blood pumping. And with that in mind, never have I visited such a well-equipped house of correction as Miss Berkeley's. She has spared no expense in assembling a veritable arsenal of punishment-inflicting tools. There are switches with a dozen whip-thongs on each, an assortment of cat and nine tails in different sizes, some with needle points worked into the leather, a multitude of canes, 
and a variety of straps fashioned from toughened animal hide that have been rendered even harder from years of use, some of which are delightfully studded with nails. I'm particularly impressed with her selection of punitive greenery. If you so desire, you can be beaten all year round with a spiked or stinging plant of your choice. Holly brushes, furze brushes, a particularly spiky evergreen known as a butcher's brush. In the summer months, she even keeps large vases of nettles on hand, filled with water to make them more pliable. And once a fellow has finally decided with what he wants to be chastised, he then has the dilemma of deciding where to stand while it's done. If he doesn't fancy being strapped to the horse, he can always make his way to the second floor of Miss Berkeley's house, where she has thoughtfully attached to her ceiling a hook and pulley so that he can be hauled up by his hands and lightly suspended as he's being whipped. For those who may require a little additional stimulation, either before or during their punishments, Miss Berkeley also happens to be the curator of one of the finest collections of erotic imagery in London. Of course, it goes without saying that Miss Berkeley is as shrewd with money as she is skilled with a cane. All of her clients are from the upper echelons of society, members of the nobility, politicians, barristers, judges, churchmen and the like. The lower classes, it seems, are not as enamoured of a sound thrashing as their betters. I've heard that His Majesty King George IV was a regular visitor to the flogging house of Mrs Collett of Tavistock Court. Perhaps, were it not for his recent demise, he would now be availing himself of the facilities here. God bless him. It also goes without saying that the rich and powerful nature of her clientele means that Miss Berkeley never gets raided by agents of the law, unlike many of her more conventional contemporaries. I would stake my family's good name that she will not see the inside of a prison cell, or indeed end her days on the Australian coast. Nothing Miss Berkeley provides comes without a considerable price, which these pillars of the British Empire are more than willing to pay. There's rumour that in the past eight years she has amassed a fortune of over £10,000. Her expensive services do not solely focus on those wishing to be the recipient of a beating. She's also happy to welcome those who like to administer one. She is perfectly happy to be whipped herself if the price is sufficient and no doubt derives much pleasure from the experience. If, however, the pain a client wishes to inflict is more than she's prepared to endure, she has several strumpets in her employ who are willing to withstand the most violent abuse in return for coin. I've just taken the rod to a few of them myself, just by way of a change, you understand, and can attest that Miss Ring, One-Eyed Peg, Ball-Cunted Poll and Ebony Bet are nothing if not stoical, unless, of course, you pay them to scream. I'm not sure why the act of flagellation has become so well esteemed in England. Perhaps the cold weather's got something to do with it. Certainly, nowhere else in the world is there such a deep affection for the rod. For myself, I have fond memories of my days at boarding school, when I was first introduced to the birch as a means of disciplining boys for poor performance and lax behaviour. I lost count of the number of times I was thoroughly beaten by a master or a prefect for daydreaming in Latin or not playing hard enough on the sports field. But while many of my fellow pupils shrank from the blows, nursing their welts and easing their red raw posteriors slowly onto nearby cushions, I found the act engendered a most stimulating rush of blood to my extremities. Later, as a young officer, I watched with envy as some common trooper was tied to the triangle following a misdemeanour, probably drunkenness, and given a taste of the cat. With each stroke, as the knotted leather ends of the whip drew more and more blood from his back while he bit down upon a strip of the same material to stop himself from crying out, I felt every nerve in my body tingling. Was I somehow at fault for feelings such as this? Upon my return to civilian life, I endeavoured to find out. It was Miss Berkeley, an expert on such matters, who taught me that my tastes were far from unique and that embracing them could even be beneficial to my health. It's long been accepted in medical circles that flagellation can have a rejuvenating effect on the body, invigorating it and giving one a healthy glow. For many, particularly elderly gentlemen, it has proven to be effective in restoring virility, bringing that which was once dead very much back to life. Its benefits, however, are not just enjoyed by the old and infirm. There are many young and virile men, and indeed some women, for whom pleasure and pain are inextricably connected. 
Mary Wilson, a much-beloved governess of whom I've previously spoken, drew upon her years of experience to determine the three types of person who were drawn to this particular pastime. 1. Those who like to receive fustigation, more or less severe, from the hands of a fine woman, who is sufficiently robust to wield the rod with vigour and effect. 2. Those who desire to administer birch discipline on the white and plump buttocks of a female. 3. Those who neither wish to be passive recipients nor active administrators of birch discipline, but derive sufficient excitement as mere spectators of the sport. For women, venturing into an establishment such as this is rare, although those that do attend return to their husbands fully invigorated. For most ladies interested in the sensations of the birch, membership of small private clubs containing like-minded women is a far less vulgar way to satisfy their appetites. Many, bored by the indifference of continuing married life, see it as a way to experience once again the ecstasy of their younger days without making a cuckold of their husbands. Once assembled, lots are drawn, and after a speech delivered by the club president about the therapeutic effects of flagellation, half the women assume the position of recipients, lifting their skirts to expose their most sensitive parts. The other half are each given a rod, and watch as the president, a woman such as Miss Berkeley perhaps, provides a demonstration of the most efficacious techniques, starting with light whipping of the calves and progressing upwards to heavier strokes on the posterior. Once it's understood what must be done, they then take their turn in administering punishment to their fellows, who may have the opportunity to return the favour later. Most of these ladies would scorn those who paid a governess to beat them at a flogging house, but all still leave with their buttocks red and their inner hunger satisfied, so, in truth, the two experiences are not that different. My advice to a husband whose wife appears listless in his presence, see if she's hiding Exhibition of Female Flagellants or another of George Cannon's books in her sewing box, and if she is, invest in a rattan cane. I can offer no greater an example of the high regard and devotion that Teresa Berkeley evokes than this letter received by her just a few days ago and shown to me in the strictest confidence. Honoured lady, I am an ill-behaved young man and quite incorrigible. The most celebrated tutors in London have chastised me but have been unable to curb my willfulness. A gentleman by the name of Brunswick recommended me to a Madame Brown, who was supposed to have remarkably strong arms. Another sent me to Madame Wilson in Marylebone, who was even less slenderly built. The old hotelier, January of Leicester Square, took me to Mrs. Calmer's, who's supposed to be very experienced with the use of the stick, and I was invited to dinner with this lady. She received me in her elegantly appointed house, but to no purpose. In spite of her imposing form and the strength of her arm, she could make no impression on me. Another advised me to go to Mrs. Jones, but she, like all the others, tried in vain to belabber my back with sticks. Captain Johnson recommended me to Betsy Burgess, who's supposed to be a skilful governess. The bookseller, Brooks of Bond Street, gave me one of Mrs. Collett's cards, and also Mrs. Beverley's. I'm aware that all of these ladies understand their profession, but their united efforts failed to make any impression on me. Finally, honoured lady, I received an introduction from your close friend Count G, which is causing me to jump for joy because I've been told of your famous apparatus, the Chavalet, which should succeed in punishing sufficiently undisciplined young men like myself. I will come and see you at the beginning of February, when I'm in London with my friend the Count, where parliamentary duties await us. I herewith give you a list of my requirements. It is necessary that I should be securely fastened to the Chavalet, with chains, which I will bring myself. A pound sterling for the first blood drawn. Two pounds sterling if the blood runs down to my heels. Three pounds sterling if my heels are bathed in blood. Four pounds sterling if the blood reaches the floor. Five pounds sterling if you succeed in making me lose consciousness. I am, honoured lady, you're quite incorrigible, O. Oh.
The identity of the mysterious author of this heartfelt missive is, sadly, lost to the mists of time. By the 1830s, flagellation had been a particularly popular English pastime for over 100 years. There's an elderly character in a play by Thomas Shadwell entitled The Virtuoso, who says of his addiction to it that, I was so used to it at Westminster School that I could never leave it off since. And that was back in 1676. It seems to have really taken hold of the public imagination, though, after the publication of A Trieste on the Use of Flogging in 1718, which appears to have extolled its arguably beneficial medical properties. After this, specialist flogging brothels sprang up all over London, and the city became the slap capital of Europe. One of the madams who took advantage of this love of all things corporal was a lady named Mother Burgess, who found herself and her specialities immortalised in a poem about the joys of Covent Garden written in 1738, entitled The Paphian Grove. An extract of the bit about her reads, With breeches down, there let some lusty lad. To desperate sickness, desperate cures are had, and honest birch excoriate your hide, and flog the cupid from your scourged backside. By the late 18th century, such establishments were even being frequented by royalty. As we've heard, when King George IV was Prince Regent, he was a regular at Mrs. Collett's House of Correction, although whether he was a flogger or a floggee isn't known. After Theresa Berkeley had hung up her rod, she was succeeded by a host of other madams, such as Sarah Potter, who worked from a variety of premises around Leicester Square, Wardour Street and Covent Garden. She was arrested in 1873, following which a pamphlet was published giving Victorian society the shocking details of her tawdry business. It read, Under the auspices of the Society for the Protection of Females, Seizure was made at the then notorious Academy of Sarah Potter, alias Stuart, in Wardour Street, and a rare collection of flagellation apparatus was taken to Westminster Police Court, when the general public for the first time became aware that young females were decoyed into Stuart's school of flogging to undergo the ordeal of the birch from old and young flagellists for the benefit of the woman Stuart. These curious specimens of her stock in trade consisted of a folding ladder with straps, birch rods, furs brooms and secret implements for the use of male and female. Her method of conducting business was to get hold of young girls, board, lodge and clothe them and in return they were obliged to administer to the lusts of the patrons of the boarding house. They were flogged in different ways, sometimes strapped to the ladder, at others they were flogged round the room, at times they were laid on the bed. Every device or variation which perverted ingenuity could devise was resorted to to give variety to the orgies, in return for which the mistress of the house was paid sums varying from £5 to £15. The profits of this school enabled Stuart to keep a country house and a fancy man to the great scandal of the community. As for Teresa herself, she died in 1836. Her brother, who ironically was a missionary, rushed back from Australia to handle her estate but when he found out where her money had come from, he legged it back to Oz in a frenzy of Christian indignation and completely renounced all claim on it. The estate was valued at around £100,000, which I've worked out to be around £11 million in today's money. But that can't be right, can it? Anyway, it was also offered to the executor of her will, one Dr Vance, who was her medical attendant, but he refused it too, so it ended up going to the Crown. Which, in a weird way, is kind of like the royal family getting its money back, with quite a bit of interest. It's also rumoured that Dr Vance came into possession of a box containing letters from a variety of very wealthy and important men and women who visited Teresa's establishment, the publication of which would have caused a tsunami of embarrassment all across English society. It's said, though, that he burned them all. Nice one, Dr Vance. As for the legendary Berkeley horse, it found its way into the collection of the Royal Society of Arts, who promised to display it publicly. Now I can find no record if they ever did that, or indeed any indication that they still have possession of it. I'd like to think that it's still being used somewhere by some mild-mannered academic in a dusty storage cupboard somewhere. But we'll never know. Or will we? Next time on Rogue's Gallery Uncovered... 
bad girl, good behaviour. The art of not giving a damn, offending just about everybody, and inventing sex. With Mae West. I hope you're still enjoying the podcast. Don't forget to get in touch and let me know what you think and who should be included by visiting roguesgalleryuncovered.com and using the contact form at the bottom of the homepage. If you've got any suggestions of roguish history books I should read, I'd also appreciate that. I've got loads, and although my wife despairs of the amount of books I have all over the house, I can always do with a few more. I'm currently working my way through a biography of the Marquis de Sade by Neil Schaefer. He's definitely going to be the subject of an episode or two. De Sade, not Schaefer. You can sign up to the newsletter on the website too, as a great many rogues already have. This comes out roughly once a month and should keep you up to date with all my devious schemes. The site also has an actual gallery, four in fact, featuring portraits of various rogues along with contemporary scenes of their shocking behaviour. There's the official store where you can get exclusive merchandise. If you fancy walking into the pub wearing a Wicked Jimmy What a c- t-shirt this summer, your dream can become a stylish reality. The other thing you can do on the website is support the podcast with a small regular donation via Patreon. Every penny goes into making Rogues Gallery Uncovered grow and allows me to devote more time and resources to it. RGU, as I just suddenly started calling it, is an independent podcast that's researched, written, hosted, produced and edited just by me. So the generosity of people who enjoy it is really, really important. There's access to some exclusive roguish extras for patrons, along with, of course, my sincere gratitude. And you know how difficult it is for a rogue to be sincere. Anyway, before I get too maudlin, I'll pop off and do something naughty. So have a great week, stay roguish, and I'll see you yesterday. <laughs>